Oh, great. Okay, glad we're all here. Perfect. It worked out. So I'll just start by introducing the event, and then I'll hand things over to you guys. But yeah, exciting things that are coming up. So good evening, everybody. Everybody watching. I'm glad that to see some people have joined already. So that's great. Um, but we'll kick things off. So thank you all for joining in our Instagram live event on the topic of classic novels, radical women, as Plumleaf Press launches a new line of Plumleaf vintage books. Um, tonight, you will all meet three talented authors, each of whom wrote the introduction to one of our Plumleaf Vintage books, who will be discussing the relevance of classics in today's world, specifically Lady Susan by Jane Austen, The Grey Woman by Elizabeth Gaskell, and The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. So I'd like, you to, I'd like to introduce you to our first author, who is Natalie Jenner, best-selling author of the Jane Austen Society, with a new book coming out in the spring of 2022 titled Bloomsbury Girls. Very exciting. And next we have Molly Greeley, <laughs> author of The Clergyman's Wife, as well as her debut novel, The Heiress. And finally, we have Fanula Austin, author of Bron Bronte's Mistress and founder of the Secret Victorianist blog. So we are excited to have you all here for tonight's event. There will be a Q&A period uh, near the end, but you can also submit your questions um, anytime throughout the event. And later we'll also be announcing the winners of the book giveaways, so stay tuned for that. And yeah, and that's it from me for now. Um, I'm happy to turn things over to Natalie, Molly, and Fanula to introduce themselves further and take things from here. Um, well, I'll start because I live geographically the closest. <laughs> Sophia, I don't really know where in Oakley you are, but... I live in a very small town in Canada, and it happens to be the home of this amazing indie publisher, Plumleaf Press. And I met Maggie, the founder, when I had my own little bookshop, and she used to come in. She was a very devoted, <laughs> very voracious customer. And she um, asked me, as a Canadian author who had written a book, uh, my debut book, it's called The Jane Austen Society, and she asked me if I would write the introduction to her concept of reissuing uh, classic works by women, um, primarily these first three with this epistolary form of letters being a, a big component of them. And of course I said, yes. And that's pretty much how I got involved and how, why I'm here tonight. And I'm very lucky to know the next two authors um, who are going to now introduce themselves to you because they are also debut authors and we have very much bonded over releasing books in the pandemic. So I'll leave it over now to Molly. Uh, hi, I'm Molly Greeley. Um, I'm the author of The Clergyman's Wife, which is my debut novel, and The Heiress. Both of them are takes on Pride and Prejudice. And um, Natalie asked me whether I would be interested in writing the introduction to Palm Leaf Press's um, The Grey Woman, and I was very excited about that. Um, I, it was a book I read a long time ago and was excited to revisit it. Um, and yeah, thank you for that. And I'll round it, round it out. Hi, everyone. It's Neela Austin. Um, Natalie also brought me in on this great project. It was awesome that we could all be such a support to each other, having books come out during the pandemic in 2020. And there were great synergies between our books um, mm -hmm. because these two are the Jane Austen experts. And my book um, was based on a real incident in the lives of the Bronte family. Um, so the book that I wrote an introduction for um, in this series is The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. And it was just really exciting for me because Anne Bronte was actually a character in my debut novel, Bronte's Mistress. So I went from seeing her through somebody else's eyes in a fictional setting to writing an introduction to, which I think is her best book. So um, Fanula and I have actually uh, did, did an event where we were talking about the Austens versus Bronte and Gaskell doesn't really get in there too much, although there is a connection as well with the Brontes given that she was a friend, um, especially of Charlotte and wrote what I think, and Fanula, I think we've talked about this, which was an excellent, I thought very interesting insider account uh, biography of Charlotte after her, after her passing. And one of the things we wanted to talk to everyone about tonight, um, I guess first and foremost is why these old books why do books from one to 200 years ago or more have a resonance for us today, should have a resonance for us today, and why it's such a great idea that an indie press like Plumleaf has decided to reissue them. Um, so I guess first I'll just kind of generally throw it out to you guys um, about why I know like me, we read a lot of classic books, we read a lot of older women 
authored books. And what is it that you're thinking um, is the most key thing we want our audience tonight to know about why we think they're valuable? Um, I guess for me, I think it's very interesting how some of the themes that come up in these older books, you know, they are, you know, one, 200, even four years old. They're still completely relevant to us today, sometimes in ways that are a little bit depressing that things haven't changed more. But, um, but especially these books authored by women and women who were writing about, you know, the big issues that women were dealing with then. Um, and I, I think that they just, they've always resonated with me, um, the mm -hmm. feminist themes in these books. Yeah, I can jump in here. And um, for everyone watching, I'd love to know as well, Jane Austen or the Brontes, <laughs> let us know who your favorites are in the chat. <laughs> those messages. Don't let Natalie win out again like last time. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> but my serious <laughs> answer to this is I'd echo everything that Molly said. Um, another thing I'd add is often these books by women have quite difficult publication history. So mm -hmm. in the case of Tenant of Wildfell Hall, um, the text was very much changed in later years. So the shocking first edition was edited. And so many of the books that you might pick up in a bookstore now, if you see a secondhand edition of Tenant of Wildfell Hall, it might say complete and unabridged on the front, but it might actually be that truncated version um, that really takes away some of Anne Bronte's artistic vision. And we can blame her sister, Charla Bronte, for some of that too, this idea that this book was unsuitable and didn't depict um, the true Anne. And I can see that Tina's in the chat saying Tina Anne, so thank you for that. Um, so I think that's another wonderful reason, not only are these books kind of beautifully presented, but the fidelity to the text and returning these women's words to the way they were meant to be presented, mm -hmm. the way they were meant to be written, is something that was really important to me. Yeah, I think the concept of the woman's voice, I mean, with having letters be such a big part as well of, of these three books, um, is that idea of this unmitigated voice of pure human experience, needs, desire, want, that was litigated and mitigated and, you know, basically censored often. And you're absolutely right, Camilla, this is incredibly valuable, is for us to see exactly how a woman was perceiving her character was experiencing and how that character was also conveying her experience, albeit in a different time. The one thing I always get from classics that I love is how unchangeable human nature is. And I think the study of history and the study of classics also finally do lend themselves to that sense that we are part of a continuum, that we are not that different, that there, because we are not different, there are lessons to be learned from these stories of the past as well. Do you guys feel, for me, with my particular book, which is, I would call more social satire, the letters, the letters work in a reflective way of the text because my book, Lady Susan, that I wrote the introduction to, I mean, Austin's book, obviously, but the book I wrote the introduction to is very much about a master manipulator who would be at, at home on any political stage today. And she is a, just a master deceiver, champion of rhetoric. Um, she can eloquently run circles around anybody. And the use of letters in my, the book that I wrote the introduction to by, by Jane Austen, the use of letters is allowing the reader to see that brilliance firsthand. And you can get, actually, you can actually feel yourself getting sucked into the point of view because of the intimacy between the reader and that voice. There's no narrative voice in between. There, we get to be in that sort of that gap as my introduction to Lady Susan, you know, talks about. And I was wondering for you guys, that's how letters work in my text. They allow a master manipulator to really flex her muscles, similar to Les Lisons de Jeros. And I was wondering with you guys, um, the role of letters, which was important, I believe, to Plumlee in picking these books, um, how you perceive them working in your text. Yeah, I can jump in there. Tenet is really interesting because the whole thing is in a letter, but then we have this diary, right? The Helen's diary comes in um, part of the way through the book, and then we get some access to her voice. So she's been the mysterious tenant um, up until that point. And then we get the real intimacy, which is even closer than a letter. Your diary is meant to be reflection for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think diaries being made public is a, a theme, not just in Victorian novels, but in Victorian um, history and culture. There was a, a very famous um, divorce trial um, later in the 19th century with a Mrs. Robinson, linked back to Bronte's mistress, um, <laughs> who her private diaries were brought up as evidence that she was unfaithful to her husband in court. Um, so one thing I was thinking about actually was this idea of distance or closeness. So early in um, the tent of Wildfell Hall, 
we start with a male protagonist, Gilbert, mm -hmm. and I think he almost plays out the role of the woman in a gothic novel, the mysterious stranger, the house on the hill, the secrets from the past. And he's the innocent, um, who's her social inferior. He's a farmer. He's very sexually inexperienced, unlike her, uh, kind of this married woman um, who, you know, he thinks is a widow. And so I think it's interesting that reversal that comes where we go from her as the mysterious other to the intimacy of her diary papers and how we're guided through that. And then of course, it's just really fun to believe that the whole book is a found document that we're peering mm -hmm. inside someone else's correspondence. And I have a little bit of that in my debut novel, Bronte's Mistress 2, which starts with the idea that this is a, a found manuscript that's been unearthed and a newspaper article detailing that discovery. That, that's actually, it's interesting because as you're saying that, I was thinking that's just so popular today though. We are all historical fiction writers, that concept of someone finding something, mm -hmm. some record, right, that's been hidden. And that these women were writing about this at that time is just shows us again, I think their creativity. And Molly, what about you with the letters for The Grey Woman? In The Grey Woman, it's interesting. <laughs> it's, right. it's interesting, The Grey Woman, because she, the main character, Anna, is writing to her daughter. And so there's the, and it's, it's kind of a desperate letter. She has a reason why she's writing to her daughter and you don't find out the reason till the end, but she's telling her daughter this whole history that her daughter clearly doesn't know about, you know, the, you know this ter these terrible times in Anna's life. And it's, it's, there's just this desperation that comes through. And I think it's partly because she's writing to someone whose opinion she values, who she wants to think well of her. Um, you know, and who is her child. And then, and, but there's also just this kind of sense for, for me that she's, you know, completely putting herself out there, making herself human to her child. And um, I didn't get the sense in this particular book that it, that letters used as, man, as a manipulation. It was more mm. that she was exposing herself through her letters in a way she hadn't been able to. Yeah. 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 Never Sorry, so, I was going to say, the other one to bring up, um, not in this set of books, but of course, Jane Eyre, an autobiography, right? So yeah. this idea of presenting things, which we now know are fiction, as, yeah. well, they just might be true. And yeah. I think about that when they obfuscate the names of the towns and the county, and Bronte does that in this book. And yeah. it's just jolly good fun, this idea that, you know, it could, the truth could be stranger than fiction. And it's actually, it's really funny too, because um, as you guys were talking, I was thinking about how that these books were overlooked and Jane, Jane Austen's Lady Susan wasn't actually published until 1871, I believe, which was over 50 years after, you know, after her passing in 1817. So then as you're talking, I was thinking, are all our characters, main protagonists, female protagonists, moms who have had marriages? Is that right? Yeah. Yes, and that's really the the protagonist of Tenant is up for debate, right? Because yes. we do start with Gilbert and we end with Gilbert. Yes. Yes. The main female character. The main female stuff. character. And in our and they're having to make choices. I mean, I think uh, one of the other things I was really looking forward to talking to you guys about is the the feminist um sort of treasury we have here with these types of classics because we're seeing women struggling with things just like Fenella said at the beginning that haven't changed I think that much or was it Molly um but also this concept of women making choices who might have already been married or widowed have left their spouses etc and it's still difficult obviously for anybody when there's marital breakdown but these books really go at it and I was really like really really thrilled when I was reading Lady Susan I was like you know, this is pretty saucy for a 19 year old Jane Austen to be writing about this widow of four months, you know, tearing through these other households and, and having all these men, men much younger than her by 12 years and married men falling in love with her. And, and I loved that. It was so fun. It was so fresh to me. And uh, I thought that was something as well on a fun level, but on a serious level, I think our books have a lot to say about the, the desire of humans for social ease and the pressures that come from trying to have a life of comfort. I don't mean wealth necessarily, but just control and calm. What about, what about your main female protagonists in your books? I mean, I think mine um, is, gosh, I mean, th this book really, really struck me, um, especially reading it, you know, now that I'm an adult, I think the last time I read it, I was in middle school and, yeah. um, and it was, 
And so rereading it um, as an adult, I was so struck by, basically, it seems to almost tell women don't get married. Like, this is a terrible idea. And just that idea back in, you know, Victorian times would have been, you know, outrageous. And, and then, you know, and if you do get married and you're in a terrible marriage, do something about it. Yeah. Leave. You know, like, do, yeah. do whatever it takes. And um, it, it was just full of, you know, just rich with feminist themes. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And completely subversive in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I'm sure many people watching are watching this because they do like classics. But I think for people who don't like classic books, some of the reasons they might think they have for that are, oh, well, you know, the Victorians, they blushed at the side of a table leg or yeah. the stuff that we're talking about here is very frivolous. But in these books, these are not frivolous themes. It's the thing you're saying, Natalie. So in Tenet of Wildfell Hall, this is about a custody dispute at its heart. This is about domestic violence, alcoholism. Yeah. There's a subplot about drug abuse. There's marital infidelity. All of these are still shocking now. Um, we might be living in a world, thankfully, that gives women a few more legal rights when it comes to protecting themselves and their children. But these themes haven't stopped shocking us. And in some ways, I, I feel like contemporary historical fiction, so historical fiction being written now, still tends to favor the, the younger female protagonist who's maybe just starting out in the world, young yes. debutante, her first love, her first marriage. And so it's refreshing for me to see that even all the way back then, there were these wonderful books about women who've lived a little bit longer, right? Like certainly not old, um, Helen. Like me. <laughs> um, but you know, she has been married, she has had a child and she's gone through a lot. Um, and yeah, I find that a breath of fresh air. Some um, live message just asked, actually, my wife enjoyed Jane Eyre. Why do you think there are being so many retellings of that book? And Fanula, because you're our resident Bronte expert, um, you just had alluded to that idea of the Bildus Roman, the, the, the young life starting out, et cetera. Is that part of it, do you think? I think it's part of it. Um, I think that Jane is a very compelling character that a lot of people can relate to. I, I think because this idea of being overlooked publicly but having a passionate inner life is something that a lot of people who like reading naturally gravitate to. So I think a lot of people see themselves in Jane. And it's just, it's just a brilliant book. Um, Tenet of Wildfell Hall actually has had two TV adaptations. So it has had some of the adaptation love. I watched the 1996 one again recently, and I think it's very faithful to the book and mm -hmm. it's a great way to dip in um, mm -hmm. before or after you read the Plum Leaf edition. Yes. Um, but Anne Bronte's Agnes Grey has not been adapted to my knowledge. So that's the Bronte one that I'm looking for that retelling. And I hope that the BBC or Netflix or somebody gets on that and rectifies it soon. After they do all our books. Um, yeah, I like but, Susan, <laughs> but I have to fun. say, shout out. I said to my husband, we, we love Whit Stillman movies and we've watched Lady Susan together. It's been a few years that we've watched it together. And I said, you need to read Lady Susan, Rob. I said to him, I said, you are going to bust a gut laughing. It's so brilliantly funny, so wickedly funny. But you're going to want to um, watch the movie first because everyone is called Vernon or Manwaring. It gets very confusing. There's a lot of the same last names. And I don't mean that as a discredit to my spouse. Uh, I have to keep checking the table of contents as I'm reading these letters between all these family members. And I have to do a shout out for the the adaptation from I think it was 2017 of Lady Susan. It's called Love and Friendship with Kate Beckinsale by Whit Stillman. It's an excellent way as well to sort of like ease your way into sort of what's conceptually going on and who the different characters are. Uh, and then you can read it and really capture I think the, the wit that's at play there. Um, I have to learn how to scroll down here. Um, yeah, no, so, Tina's asking about the yeah. biographical um, kind of link with Anne and Tenant of Wildfell Hall and mentioned earlier that that was um you know that charlotte bronte did some work towards suppressing this book and this is one of the working theories why that it hit a little mm. bit close to home because of branwell's problems with addiction and of course the affair with a married woman that was the basis for my book um so yes i think some of it is biographical i would like just to kind of not only see that though i think it's an amazing leap of empathy i write about this in my introduction the fact that she chooses not to write the governess, but actually the woman of the house, the governess and tenant is, you know, not to be trusted, right? She's not the innocent, poor, plain girl um, in Jane Eyre. So I think, yes, there are some links to the Bronte story, but I also think that Anne was wonderful and imaginative and was able to step out outside herself, mm -hmm. probably more successfully than Charlotte ever did in any of her novels. 
And Molly, there was something fascinating about um, the book that you have written the introduction to. And I was reading, both of you wrote amazing introductions. And when I was reading Molly's, you had mentioned the relationship between the, the main woman and Amante. I can't remember the name with the servant. This is terrible. I mean, it's, it's French and I'm not, I don't speak French. So I right. don't know how to pronounce that. I, in my so, mind, Amante, but I'm not sure that that's correct. <laughs> and actually, I thought, I thought you just you had isolated and picked up on this aspect, I think, of literature. That's another reason why we should be looking at these books. And Molly, I'd love to hear your view on this, which is the relationships between the women that are often driving the plot and the, the inversion of a spousal relationship that you picked up on, which I thought so brilliantly in your introduction. Oh, I mean, that was just it was so interesting because um, the maid herself was kind of a masculine character. Um, I mean, she, you know, she she was absolutely female, but she, you know, pretended to be Anne's husband um, in, uh, in order to get her away from her real husband, you know, dressed in a masculine way. She, she was able to like pick Anna up and just carry her around. And it was like, it just that in itself felt like an interesting subversion, but they also end up having almost, almost a marriage mm -hmm. together. Like they, 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 they form a life together. What, you know, and there's no hint as to whether it's more, you know, whether there's actually romance to it, but, um, but if, if nothing else, it is like this huge testament to the power of female friendship and women working together. And yeah. um, I mean, they they managed to to do some pretty amazing things um, in in that book to get, by working together. It's interesting. Also, I should just say to people that are watching, thank you for being here. We didn't. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> please hit us up with questions in the little scroll bar. I'm miraculously able to see tonight. I don't know what happened. So um, I can read them very easily. So we would love to uh, answer your questions. One of the things, um, we've all studied literature, I believe, the three of us, correct? Um, at, yeah, at the university and, and uh, familiar of a, ma a master's, correct? Yeah. Know. Yeah. And we, we know that there's a value in these books on a literary level for readers who are interested in how good literature is forged and how it works. I know that with my book, I see a 19 year old Jane Austen in love with her power with story, in love with her power with words. And I think falling in love with characters who share that eloquence and I can see in Lady Susan a much more successful version of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, Molly. Yeah. Um, and I can see in uh, James yeah. Martin, the future chatty fools of the Miss Bateses and you know the Mr. Collinses. I can see the future maturity of Jane Austen to come. Um, I can also see the absence of her moral voice in doing a book that's solely letters. Mm -hmm. And I can see her celebrating those characters who get what they want through their power of communication and their, their power of storytelling. And that for me is why Lady Susan is in some ways such a, an important book in the story of Jane Austen's journey to being a writer. Um, but it doesn't have some of the trademarks of her genius um, as a specimen. Whereas your books are women writing and more of the maturity of their voice. And I was interested into what you each think your books are bringing to the canon of Gaskell and, Br and Anne Bronte. Go for it, Molly. Um, I, for Gaskell, I think for me, um, part of it, I mean, she does have hints of the Gothic in some of her longer mm -hmm. novels as well, but they're, they're hints. And this book is just revels in all the Gothic tropes. And it's, um, I mean, it just seemed to, it felt to me like she had fun writing it. Like that she, this is something that she really enjoyed doing. Um, and it just, it comes out in the writing. Like I, it, the story just pulls you right along and you want, you, you know, she has all of these ways of making you question, you know, what's really happening and, um, and why this list is being written. Um, I just, it's different from a lot of the other of Gaskell's works that I've read in that those are more kind of social realism. And this, mm -hmm. this is just Gothic fun. <laughs> and, um, but with a lot of feminism and social commentary thrown in. Um, it's brilliant. And I think on my side, I mean, Anne Bronte only wrote two novels, sadly. Um, she died very young at 29. Um, so I think we were bereft of more great works of literature from her, just as we were for, from her sisters. Um, so, you know, this is not an author where jumping in and reading some of their work means that you're going to be tied up for the next 20 years. I'm not yeah. saying read every Anthony Trollope, <laughs> um, read every Dickens, read every Mary Elizabeth Braddon, like 
this pretty achievable goal. And I do think The Tenant of Wildfell Hall is the better book. I have a lot of love for Agnes Gray as well, but I think you can see the maturity of Anne's voice. And I also think that we see her moving into that more imaginative space. That question came up from Tina about biography versus fiction. Agnes mm -hmm. Gray is more biographical and it's great to see Anne here taking that leap and going somewhere else. And then on the other side, I'm just very interested with any books that get suppressed, any books that get banned, mm -hmm. any books that kind of stir up a negative reaction. And you see in the early reviews of Tennant how shocking this novel was. And you were talking about the fun that Jane Austen had writing Lady Susan. Mm -hmm. A lot of these reviewers actually speculated that Tennant mustn't have been fun to write, that it must mm -hmm. have been quite painful because of the dark themes it deals with. And then you know, a quote about it from the early 20th century, a critic was that the sound of Helen shutting her bedroom door against her husband reverberated around England, which gives you some sense of how absolutely shocking in an era before um, marital rape was recognized as even being a possibility. Um, this was very shocking to be depicted in fiction and for a woman like Anne Bronte to be having an opinion on that. So I think it's a great book in its own right. It's a great book if you love the Ever Bronte sisters, but it may be neglected Anne up till now. And yes, if you like things that stir up strong emotions and feelings, um, Tenet Wildfeld Hall certainly has done that throughout its history. There's something with women authors, which in my new book, <laughs> plug, Bloomsbury Girls coming up, when we talk about women, it being assumed that their writing has a biographical, biographical, sorry, element yeah. to it, right? And even now, I think there is... Um, an assumption by readers that there's a connection to the real life sometimes. And as practicing writers, I think we've each experienced that feeling of you think it's fully your imagination and it is. And sometimes you think it's fully your imagination and afterwards someone points out a similarity and you go, oh yeah, <laughs> I do care about that. And just snuck in there. Um, but I, I think with the Gothic in, in the book that Molly wrote the introduction to, and the really serious marital issues um, that Anne Bronte's exploring in Tenant, um, my book, I think, being sort of a bit of a different beast, we see these, these women authors really using their imaginative powers to project and create suspense and give the reader, like you said, this very powerful experience. And I think that that's another value of, of, these, of these older texts as well. Um, I've sort of been just winging this here, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to hit us up. But let's now talk about how beautiful these books are. Could you believe it when you open these, these books? No, they're stunning. No. They're <laughs> absolutely yes. beautiful um, from the cover to the beautiful pattern inside. Oh gosh, um, yes. And of course, there's a place for you to add your inscription at the front. If like, you're that is the best. I love that when they yeah. let you do that in a book. Molly, you even got an illustration, I think, right? There's this. Like stunning. Yeah, this is so beautiful. So beautiful. Really sturdy. And with really, like, I loved with my book because it's a collection of letters. And so there's, like, little envelopes with the initials for the different characters, you know. And yours has the theme, I think, of flowers, Molly. Mm -hmm. So they are beautiful. They're, they're so well-priced. And it's the beginning It's the launch of a series, a vintage series that's dedicated to these um, classic texts by women. Yes. And I think it's very important that we, that we talk about that. I mean, we're three women authors. Um, I debuted, I think I was age 52. So, um, you know, we're all, all at different stages. Molly's got three children. Are they all under 10? They are. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Infinite is a baby of the lot. And she's got this very glamorous apartment in New York that I, if I, if I see one more photo of on Instagram, I'm oh, be so like permanently <laughs> green. But, um, but we, you know, these are the, our formative influences. I'm doing an event tomorrow about who writers read. And, you know, I think all three of us as readers, let alone writers, I think we do read very voraciously and broadly. And I think we were interested in the past. I think I know for a fact we're reading a lot of modern fiction because we love our debut brothers and sisters. And we've been supporting a lot of them. Um, but when you look at the time periods of what you like to read, is there one that you particularly gravitate to? R regardless of being a historical fiction author, is there one that you particularly gravitate to in terms of the history of literature? 
And while we're thinking of that, I <laughs> yes. just want to say that for people in the chat, tell Plumleaf which books you would love them to do in this series next, right? Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Do you yes. know a lesser known book by a woman from the past? Like we'd love um, to take, um, you know, suggestions and hopefully get them a prod in that direction. But Molly, were you going to jump in on period? No, I've lost track of the question. I'm so sorry. I'm <laughs> completely lost track of it. Don't ask me. I'm 53. <laughs> I, have, I don't even know what to say. Um, oh, my gosh. You asked, an, you asked an excellent question, and it's gone. It's a lot. Can you help? <laughs> yeah, so I think it was about the time period that resonated. Oh, yeah. Like, yes. I, I find I love reading anything between... Oh, I sort of like between the 1860s and uh, 1930s. I don't know what it is. That's sort of like my favorite. So I think it's a period of time in literature when there's an increasing awareness of a distance between the external self and the internal self. And I find that really fascinating with, you know, when I look at an E.M. Forster or an E.S. Wharton, you know, those, that time period. Um, Molly, what about you? Is there a time period you find you gravitate towards? Um, as far as books that were written at a certain time period, I would agree with you completely. Um, as far as historical period to read about, um, I love medieval. Yeah, um, you go way back. Yeah, yeah I, lo I love that. I love um, anything about the ancient world. Um, I don't know. And almost anything, really. Um, but yeah. I, I tend to stay either contemporary or like below World War II. <laughs> I'm not really sure why. But yeah, um, yeah. for me, um, if I'm reading literature written in that period, the 19th century is kind of my homeland. It's where my yeah. master's degree is in. I will be very flexible for the purposes of my blog, though it's the secret Victorianist. I do the full 19th century, even before Victoria came to the throne. And occasionally I'll creep up into the early 1900s and sort of claim it. Uh, my dissertation was on novels primarily from the 1860s, 1870s, mm -hmm. so sensation fiction. Um, but then with historical fiction being written now, um, mm -hmm. obviously I love stuff in my period, um, but I love reading broadly too. And I love being taken to places that I haven't necessarily been before. Yeah. Um, I blurbed a book that was set in Russia in the 1600s, which was just a period I knew nothing about Russian history then. And mm -hmm. that was a wonderful place to go. Obviously there's a lot of great World War II fiction. So dabble in that. And then the American versus British um, thing for me is interesting too, because I'm much more familiar with 19th century society in a British and specifically English setting. Um, so it's always fun to dabble with American books from that period and see what stays the same, um, but what is a little bit different the other side of the Atlantic. That's really interesting and truthfully something I hadn't really considered before. Are there, are there major differences between um, the authors and the way they write? <laughs> That's, I need to think about that. Right, I think there's like differences between class relations, right? And there's a big um, urban rural divide as well. So New York feels a little bit more European um, mm -hmm. versus when you got, you know, the Mark Twain's of the world speaking mm -hmm. about more rural parts of the United States. Um, and then of course, in what's being written now, civil war fiction um, or fiction being set right after the civil war is just mm -hmm. very interesting. That has a whole dynamic that's just missing um, from the more kind of socially oriented novels um, that we see in Britain. Right. That makes sense. Um, Somebody asked, there's two questions actually. So someone had asked about whether we collaborated with the artists that did the wonderful jobs on the designs of these books. Um, I did not, I, I don't believe, but I mean, no. they came to us, they were perfect little yeah. jewels. Like we, yeah. I just remember I was just like, well, like I'm so glad you didn't ask my opinion because like this is perfect. Um, but someone else, Mark Terpstra has just asked, what draws you to the 19th century period specifically, Vanilla, especially enough to do your dissertation on it? I think it's because I love novels and the 19th century is when the novel came into its own. So the novel, you know, really starts in the 18th century. Yes, we can claim that there were novels beforehand. You know, I've, you know, read the Latin novels like Trimalchio's Feast, but they really don't bear much resemblance to the novel as we know it now. The 19th yeah. century is when we have those powerhouses um, like George Eliot, like Dickens, like the Brontes and all of the women writers we're talking about yeah. today. Um, yeah. And then the other piece of it is for me, the 19th century is close enough that we can still understand it, but far enough that it feels like we're going on a fun vacation to another yeah. country. Um, so I kind of like to wonder, are we living in an extended Victorian age? If we're looking at the grand scheme of history, how different is now to then? Do we see a digital revolution as just the next iteration of um, an industrial revolution? 
and are our morals that different from those of people in the 19th century? Um, a lot of the time, those Victorian mores are pretty similar to more conservative mores today. And it's interesting with, with Jane Austen's um, book, Lady Susan being written when she was 19, as a collection of letters, like purely letters with a, just a really quick dramatic ending um, with a narrative voice at the end. But they think that the next book she wrote at age 20, her first initial version of Sense of Sensibility, they think it might've been fully epistolary as well. And then with Pride and Prejudice, which she wrote the following year, and isn't that for precociousness, 1920 and 21. Um, but at, at age 21, when she writes Pride and Prejudice, that there were, it might possibly have also been very strongly epistolary in that there are, I think, 16 letters fully extant still mentioned, you know, in the final, in the final book that we know today. So Jane Austen is coming out of a different literary tradition um, that is going to lead into the, the rise of the novel, which in, from the, the perspective of the 19th century is always fascinating for me is how much commerce affected the formation of the novel in terms of the periodicals and the weeklies and the monthlies and yeah. people writing for money and people writing week Five to words. week. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and writing week to week and, and just writing on demand and not knowing what your ending is going to be. And we all write very differently, I think, because I'm, I'm trying to remember, Fanula, are you the one, are you the person that told me like, you can kind of know the ending, I think, before I, you- I, I always know the ending. I, I gotta know where the destination is. But yeah, I was thinking about like people writing for Wattpad now or people doing yeah. fictional blogs or, you know, creating episodic content um, for IGTV or on yeah. YouTube. And then the other part of what I was thinking is, yes, the letters are a literary technique, but letters were also just really important to people's lives. Yes. So I imagine writing something set in 2021, it would be hard to go a whole book without anyone sending a text message, writing an email, making a phone call. Um, I think that's why some writers take their characters to a place with no service, a yoga retreat where your phones are gone, um, a yes. place in the forest where yes. guess what, folks, you can't call 911 to get rid of Or that. you write historical fiction where nobody has a cell phone. Right, <laughs> we naturally have letters, right? And I think in, you know, certainly in my novel, Bronte's Mistress, letters feature, I, I, they must in the heiress and clergyman's wife as well, right? Like, it's just, mm -hmm. that's how people communicated. Yeah. 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 Somebody, um, Molly, someone asks, in order to fully immerse yourselves in your writing, do you like to visit the book locations prior to or during your writing process? Now, I know with three little kids and writing at libraries on Sundays um, <laughs> that you're more probably a mental traveler, I tend, I tend to be more of a mental traveler. I, um, you know, have been to England and um, I, you know, in London and where the heiress is, you know, partially set in London. I've never been to Kent, which is where the other part of it is, um, and also the clergyman's wife. Um, but I saw enough of the English countryside to get a feel for it, I think. Um, however, um, I have another book coming out in 2023 that's set in Italy and France and, um, and also the Canary Islands. And I've never, I've been to France briefly and otherwise, um, well, my next book set in Italy, so you and I are going to have to somehow make a trip to Italy. Wouldn't that be perfect? Oh my gosh, um, you can't go without trip. me. Um, oh no, no, we're, oh, no we're, we're like chained to the hip now after this experience of releasing a pandemic. Um, to that end, Fanula, I know, I was so impressed because the two of you met, I believe, did you meet at the Historical Novel Society conference like three or four years ago? Yeah. I was so impressed when I learned from Fanula the amount of on the ground research that you did oh, um, up in Yorkshire for Bronte's Mistress. Yes, I did. It was intense. It wasn't a long period because I do have a day job back in New York as well. So I can't just go on lengthy trips. I mean, most writers can't, whether that's for family commitments, their jobs, financial reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I went to, um, you know, the area where my main character, Lydia Robinson lived, where Anne Bronte and Branwell Bronte worked in her house. Um, the villages of Great and Little Usbin was wonderful. I, I saw the graves of many of my characters. And then I was also in Haworth. I went to the Bronte Parsonage Museum and I was lucky enough to be given access to the archives there um, and held letters that my main character actually wrote, um, went through the paperwork. Um, funny story that at one point I got an editorial note that I had too much mahogany furniture in my book and I was able to turn around and say, well, they just liked mahogany furniture because I looked at an inventory of all the pieces in the house. Um, but I love on the ground research. Obviously, during COVID, that's not been possible. And it's mm -hmm. wonderful that we're living in a time where there's mo so many digital resources. 
Um, but Natalie, what about you? Um, either with the Jane Austen Society or Bones oh, Girls, have you been? I don't think the Jane Austen Society would exist if I hadn't sort of <laughs> kicked my family to the curb and said, I'm going to go to Chawden for a week and just immerse <laughs> myself in Jane Austen because she'd helped me through a difficult time. And I'd read all her works. And you do, it's unlike Trollope, you do hit a wall. You can read all of Jane Austen in, in the matter of a few weeks. And so I went and I spent a week in this village and everything I saw that week ended up in a scene in my book. Every single object, every view, every scene that comes to life, I remember very much being in that window seat, in that room. So I don't know if a place I don't know if a book has ever been more inspired by place than my debut novel was. And I say that with humility. Um, I am so indebted to Chawden House, the Jane Austen's House Museum, and this village of Chawden in Hampshire in England that has kept her legacy alive so that fruitcakes like me can go over and spend a whole week <laughs> doing nothing but going to a Jane Austen Museum because I love everything about Austen and I, I'm so glad that these museums, like in then Howarth as well, for the, for the Bronte Parsonage, that they have kept these houses and, and pulled together the legacy from abroad, which is so much work and so valuable and then so inspiring to writers like us. I mean, we're yes. so lucky that there are these, these wonderful places. I hope um, that Plumleaf will be able to get these beautiful additions into the gift shops of both of those. Yes. Oh, it would be yes. so wonderful. Then. Yes. I do yes. have a question I wanted to ask you guys. So, um, I mean, I think one of the great things about us being asked to write these introductions is that, yes, we all studied literature and I have a master's, but we're not academics, right? Like we don't have PhDs. We're not lecturing. I'm a groupie. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're I'm an awesome groupie. groupie. <laughs> Super fans. Um, and I think that means our introductions are a little bit more accessible for folks yes. than maybe some of the ones I, I love the, you know, ones I'd read in the Oxford University Press or in Penguin. Yeah. Um, but did you, do you read those introductions on classic books? I know I always save them up to read at the end. And yes. that was, obviously it's That's beautiful, what I do but for me, the most thrilling part of this was seeing introduction by Fanula Austin. And yeah. so do you read the introduction? I always do. Book? I always, I read them at the end, no matter where they put them in the book. That's I always I save it. <laughs> Spoiler alert, right? Yeah. But no, I always read it because there's, there's nothing like a really truly brilliant academic mind that knows that author so well um, to give you what is an incredibly rich perspective on how much there is in the text and the value of rereading as well. I get that from introductions is that sense of, oh, there is so much to excavate still. And I, I was just speaking with Jodie Forrester, um, who's rereading something, and we were talking about how it enables you when you reread a classic work to get, as in an introduction, to get a depth of understanding that you don't get when you just sort of push through really quickly mm -hmm. and you can really take your time and I think these are books as Maggie's team has said these are books to linger over they're they're beautiful objects they're not necessarily super long some of them some of them are I mean Lady Susan can be read I think in maybe one to two hours so same with you know, these are, yeah these are objects to take your time with and yeah. and uh yeah I'm seeing that Plumleaf's telling us that The Grey Woman, um, which is the book that Molly wrote the introduction for, is in the Elizabeth Gaskell house. So that's mm. super exciting. Um, oh, that's so cool. And that's awesome. a wonderful place I would love to visit. I, I did an event with them because um, my novel was partly inspired by the Elizabeth Gaskell biography yeah. of Charlotte. <laughs> right. The affair with Bramwell was, you know, mentioned in a lot of lurid detail. Um, but yes, if I could pick somewhere to go and travel to right now, I'd love to pop by the Elizabeth Gaskell house and see them in person. And it's great to know that book's there. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. So I don't know if we have any other questions coming up, um, but I know that, um, Sophia, we have winners, four winners of the book bundles to, uh, to announce now. Is that right? And I'm wondering if Sophia's going to come yeah. back on. There she is. Hi, everybody. She's coming back like a book fairy to spring. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, give a big thanks to the three of you for taking the time to join us tonight. And if anybody watching is not following them already, go and do so after this live. You won't regret it. But Natalie's right. And it is time to announce the winners of our giveaway prizes. And I hope everyone's as excited as we are. Um, we loved reading all of the comments about why you love classic novels as much as we do. And the following winners were selected through a random number generator. And we will also be in contact with each of them after the event. So without further ado, our first winner of the Natalie Jenner gift will be receiving a copy of Plumlee Finchage's Lady Susan, 
um, by Jane Austen, as well as a signed copy of the Jane Austen Society by Natalie Jenner. So the winner is username Amanda Magic. So congratulations to Amanda. And our next prize is the Molly. Yes, that's the yeah, perfect. <laughs> So you can see what you're going to be receiving, but um, our next prize is the Molly Greeley gift, which includes a copy of Plumley Vintage's The Grey Woman by Elizabeth Gaskell, and a signed copy of The Clergyman's Wife by Molly Greeley. And the winner for this prize is Christine German. So congratulations, Christine. Um, we hope you enjoy your new books. And next up to give away is the Fanula Austin gift and consisting of a copy of Plumlee Finch's Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, paired with a signed copy of Bronte's Mistress by Fanula. And the winner is Tammy Watkins, 507. So congratulations to Tammy. Um, and lastly, we have the Plumlee Press gift to give away. And the winner is going to be receiving a set of all three Plumley Vintage books, as well as a copy of the Jane Austen Society, The Clergyman's Wife, and Bronte's Mistress. So the winner of this prize is Shabby Stacy. So Shabby Stacy, <gasps> the winner. <laughs> Shabby's getting my new book from another thing because she helped do the cover reveal oh. for my new book. So so she's getting like seven books. That's amazing this week. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and she's from Canada originally too. I think she I, she's from Canada originally. She lives in the states now, but she's from Canada. Awesome! Yeah, that is one great um, grand prize. And, and I've just got to say that the whole set of the three books are just so beautiful to get them together. Yeah, we're looking for holiday gifts. Um, oh, so that's something I'd love to have under the tree. Yeah, no, they're perfect. And and um, yeah, I I got a bunch um, for my mother to give out to people being very, you know, supportive. Um, but the set if you can get all three, and have the the paper banding that goes around it, it's exquisite, really. Yeah, really lovely. Yeah, exactly. We did want to mention that all the Plumlee books are available for purchase now on our website, which is plumleepress.com, or you can find them at Indigo or select indie bookstores. So yeah, definitely check them out. And if these three authors haven't convinced you yet, I don't know. <laughs> They've done a great job tonight. Um, so yeah, we just really wanted to thank you for taking the time and everybody who joined. It was such a great discussion. It was so good to hear all your fresh perspectives on these authors and these books. So no, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Molly and Fanilla, for joining us and for joining me with writing the introduction. And thank you for letting me be here tonight chatting with you both. I miss you guys. And this was a lot of fun. So thanks for including me. Yeah, this was the dream project to be asked to get in on. So thanks, Natalie, for pulling us in. And thank you, Plumlee team, for doing such a beautiful job. Yeah, just to echo what they said, thank you. And thank you to everyone who came to, to check this out. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it was a great success. Thank you so much, everybody. And I think that's it for tonight. Good night. Good night. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody.